Hello everyone. So today I will talk about Ruby debugger upsell out and insult. This session is supposed to happen on live. However, we forgot to record the stream. So right now I'm just gonna record it again in my bedroom. So it's a little bit messed up. So please forgive me. And before we get started, um, when I talk about Ruby debugger, maybe everyone will assume that I will talk about how to use the Ruby debugger. It's totally not. Today I will talk about how to build a rubber Ruby debugger with a really simple version. And uh, before getting started, I want to introduce myself a little bit. So I have been using Ruby for about 5 years and um, I'm currently the core contributor of Ruby Kafka Island and the author of Ruby Jar, a debugger for Ruby. And uh, we, you can contact me via my GitHub at uh, this link on the screen. So let's get started. Today I will talk about um, some items. The first one is that before you, we, you can get into building a debugger, you must understand how Ruby execute your code. And then we uh, go deep and to explore how the Ruby debuggers work behind the scene. And then we finally get into building your own debugger. And uh, after that, I will introduce a tool for you. Uh, I mean to provide a better experience while you debug Ruby. So let's get into the first session. How does Ruby execute your code? At the first glance, maybe most of you are uh, taught that Ruby is an intercepting language. So will Ruby execute your code line by line, or how does how does it do in the background? It's actually more complicated than it seems. So when Ruby started um, executing your code, there are a lot of steps to execute before your code is actually running. There are buffer a new a, a pipeline to intercept your code. First, your support will be tokenized into a meaningful tokens, and the tokens will be then go to a uh, will be passed into a ST node. ST here stands for the abstract syntax tree. And then all the nodes will combine into a YAF instructions. And finally, all the YAF instructions will be intercepted by Ruby VM. It's a little bit uh, um, weird for the names, and maybe um, you are not familiar on any of this. So we will go, we'll go deep into explore with an example. This is an example, really simple one, that to uh, calculate the nth Fibonacci number. So first, we started to assign A and B to 1, and then we continue with the tree to N, and we continue assign the C to uh, be the sum of A and B, and we reassign A and B again. It's really simple and really straightforward. So when will we uh, execute your code? How does it do? First, your code will be tokenized into the meaningful tokens. What does it mean? So when you look at your code, there are a lot of like quest space, a lot of like ways of writing things differently. So if you don't want to uh, use a quest space, you can just like use as many quest space as you want, or you can just have a red line in between, so that your code still running and it means a lot. It means the same thing. However, when Ruby uh, extemized your code. The, the waste bay and the non important details as the noise to escape. So, first, your code may uh, on your code may be broken down into the chunks of the string and then uh, it will be a side or type. So, let's look at the example here. Okay, it is a uh, grid example that I use the gripper gem to generate. First, all the strings are grouped together to perform a particular function in the source Like the def here is the keyword, the function here is the method con. I mean, it is the method definition. And n here in mean, means the identity of a variable. So, because all of the codes are grouped into the chunks of a meaningful identity, the uh, Next steps is just need to read the whole identity without caring about the extra details I talk about later uh, before. So after that, all the token as 
pass into the abstract syntax tree. So what does abstract syntax tree mean? If you look at the abstract syntax tree here, it is really not meaningful to human, but it is meaningful to the program, the Ruby programming language, because it is actually how Ruby look at your code. In the structure, it is the um, actual uh, syntax of the Ruby and back into a box into a tree, so that your program can just look at this tree, traverse this tree, and it has the um, meaning and uh, it understand what you want to do with your subcode. Programming languages and usually it is treated as an internal data structure that the outside um, programmer will never want to touch that. And um, actually before Ruby 1.8, Ruby will work on the abstract syntax tree directly so that they will traverse the tree, they will understand the tree and they will do and execute uh, based on the tree directly. But after the version of Ruby 1.9, everything is just changed and uh, the abstract instruct tree is now become a, a intermediate step before they can execute your code. And after this step, this tree will be transferred into called, uh, a firm called the Yak instruction. If you are familiar with other languages like Java or even Python, you may be familiar with the term PyCode. So what does it mean? It means that your data structure will be confined into a lot of sequences next to each other with a really low level in uh, execution. So the um, this is act as the final step before the uh, Ruby VM can actually execute your code. And the app here stands for the yet another Ruby VM. So what does this look like? It looks like something like this one. Um, then maybe you don't need to actually understand everything here. You just need to uh, have a class over the structure. So you can see that the YAC instruction is a nested structure. It means that uh, an, uh, 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 an instruction sequence may contain a lot of other uh, sequences and a sequence may be assert only a unit of execution. For example, right here we have something like a good object Put is the put the 10 uh, integer into the stack and then we have the same method which is actually the con a method with a redefined argument. So its instruction will contain a low level execution used by our VM and it includes the district values such as the variables, so that the local variables or anything that we take for the execution. And it may concern other things like the local variables to identify and to store the local variables of a scope, like you when you call a function or you call a method. All the variables are redefined and stored in a place before execute it. And then uh, it contains all the things like the cache table. Uh, it too is to handle the rescue and the exception raising. And um, beside what is meaningful for the execution. Uh, instruction may contain other things like the file, the line, the code branch that creates that instruction, and some expects of flags called the trace events. So I can make those. And the trace events are really meaningful for debugger, but I will talk about that later. So after those steps, you actually, I guess that you un uh, don't actually understand how this works, right? So we will come into a real like the sample of how the Ruby VM uh, execute your code. So before that, you may be uh, surprised that Ruby VM is actually a double stack engine. It means that it includes two stacks. The first one is the current frame stack. It store the current frame, the current stack trace, and what is your control flow look like. And the second one is the variable stack. And it actually sometimes just called the stack. It is just for the variable and just that it doesn't mean to have uh, any isolation between the variables. So the control stack will uh, be responsible for controlling your program and the variable is a place to store your variables and environment. So let's get started. Um, you may be look at the current support. When your code execute a Ruby program, it will stop at the first executable line 
which is currently is the post 50C architect. And this line of code is equivalent to five instructions. And when do we start? It will buy your current context into a pixel object on top level body, which is just a, an instant of object. So um, it will equivalent to some instruction. The first one is to put self, and the second one is put what does it mean? It means that when you call any method, there must be a target for that method. So uh, when you call something like boost or uh, Fibonacci, the targets are implicit, but they still be available in the Ruby VM so that the uh, Ruby VM can uh, look up the method and can know who is the owner of that method. So in this case, when we look at the line, there are two methods only. The first one is boost, the second one is Fibonacci con. And they must need two targets. That's why they have to put self so that they put the current object into the uh, Ruby VM. And after this execution, you can see on the right with the stack here that after that, they have two objects in the stack. And then they will continue to put 10 to the stack. Yeah. And when everything is ready, they start to call the method uh, pharmacy. So as I mentioned before, this method um, will try to find the owner, I mean the target, up, uh, so that it can look up. So in this case, the target is the current object, and the pharmacy method is the uh, defined instruction, so that it uh, will look up the method in the object, and then it found the pharmacy. And finally, it will get one argument from the stack, and it starts the new fax rate. So it's actually trigger and, and it will and it pop to um, objects from the stack and we will start a new stack right here. So what does it mean? It means that when we need to open a scope, it will add one object into the control frame. So that on the object from now will be isolated absolutely from all the objects and all the variables before. So when you are in the current method, you cannot accept the outside. That's why they have a control frame. And in the control, control frame, they will initialize the local variables. In this situation, the local variable in the method is n, a, and b, in which n is the uh, argument of the method too. So by default, you can look at the top of the uh, diagram. You will see that a is equal to new, b is equal to new, but n is equal to 10. Yeah, that's right. And after that, it will look up the instruction of the method, and then it has five, eight instructions in the method. The first one is to assign one to a variable i, so it equivalent to uh, two instructions. But it put one to the stack, and then it set the local variable so that it can pop that one from the stack and assign to i. It may be a little bit weird that why it has just pushed to the stack and then it pop out recently, but it's just how it works. We, although we, it is a waste of time, why don't it just come to assign one to the method directly? Actually, in real life, Ruby will have some optimization upon this execution. It means that those two uh, instructions can be combined into one and it doesn't need to execute one. So that's why they uh, invent the whole instruction thing just for uh, optimization. If they work directly on the abstract syntax tree, it's really hard for them. It's really, really hard to for other tools to optimize. That's why they missed the instruction. Okay, let's get back. So after we uh, set the local variable one to i, it means that the uh, there is a, a local variable table and it we call the num the, the uh, variable value to one, and then it continue with the second line, which is assigned to two, and the set. Yes, the um, and it is really get getting interesting. So right now we are at the beginning of a loop. Mm, it has an iteration, and the iteration is calling from a branch from three to n. So before that, they must create a branch from uh, three to n. And right now, they get the put the tree into the stack, and they push the uh, current variable of n into the stack. 
would be 10 right now. So after that, they create a new class and from those two variables and put the rest variable back into the stack and become two dot dot ten. Yes. And right now, because it's the lowest level of abstraction and execution, everything works as uh, the same as the real life. So after we have a three on dot dot ten grant in the stack, uh, the our VM will continue to shut for the H method. And as I already said before, the each method will find a target. In this case, it is the first argument and the third uh, um, object in the stack would be the range 3 to 10. So right now, it look for the stack and it pop that, that um, object from the stack and it's actually called a method. Yes. However, each method here is implemented in C. So it is actually a socket that um, on on the execution is in the um, C uh, program, and it means that it is the merging code. Yeah, Ruby is written in C, and then um, so that um, on the uh, your Ruby code will be translated into the Yak instruction, and each Yak instruction is implemented again in C. So for speak, so if a method is already implemented in C, we cannot and we uh, should not retrieve at the actual uh, what what it did underlying because already very really fast and really meaningless to do so. So internally when the uh, ranks method and when the ranks implement the each method, it will compare the current value and the next value. So the current value is three and we compare with n which is ten. And if it's not, if it uh, hasn't existed yet, it will trigger the blocks, which in this case is the uh, lock to a side and, comp and compute the C value here. And then we will, it will add one more con control frame onto the control frame. But right now, it will add one more control frame, which is sometimes called fiber C block or something. And after that, you can see that under the, the C variable is new now. So, in this control frame, you have to use C, you use A and B too. So if the, this control frame has only C in their local table, where does A and B from? It turns out that in every control frame it will be, there is a link between the frames so that a method or uh, a variable access from the top mod frame can be accessible from the below frame, frame, as soon as they are in the same, they, they have the same, um, let's uh, call it connection. So in this connection, because your uh, block is staying in the this method, so that is the, it actually can get the closure from the above context, and so that it can assess the A and B from the frame number two. So that's how it works. And in this uh, execution context, you continue to compute uh, the value of C, which is equal to I plus B. And just the, is the same. Let's do, get the machine rate. First, if you get the, va the value of the local variable I and push it to the stack, which is one. And again, it was the variable of B, push the stack, which is one again. And it call the plus method and again it would boost the results back in the stack which is still now and then it sets the state to that method which is still so and so on so is it really um, trivial now so i will continue slowly for you to see yes and now it comes to the fun part so before when your program reaches the uh, final end of the current frame, it means that there is nothing for you to continue. It, the con control frame is now ends its life, so now it pop the control frame from the con control frame stack. Yep, and it return has a return value, but in this case, there isn't any return value. So when uh, it is it a con control frame? It will continue of the execution of the next frame. So in this case, it is the uh, each method in the runs. 
And after that, the edge method will compare the current uh, index value, which is for now, and to the end. And it's obvious that they will continue to execute the block again. And finally, they will put a new control frame again and continue the execution until a long time later. So a long time later, when your program execute the Fibonacci uh, method, you will have the last return value in the stack will be the 55. So that return value will become the argument for the next method call, which is the push. So the push method call will uh, be triggered with the object, which is the current object, and it will uh, add 55 as the first argument. Therefore, after the execution, your program will output 55. So it has your uh, Ruby VM execute your code from start to beginning. So I will stop a little bit here so that you can have any question here. Yeah. So it looks like there's no questions. Uh, it's too fast for you to type. Anyway, I will continue with the next part. So after the haunting, you there's a question. There's to be up to uh via telecom optimization. Hmm. It's a good question. Uh let me look at it a little bit. Oops, sorry. Then you can go on another time. Yep. As I mentioned above, um, there are some optimization from Ruby that they work to optimize the uh, instruction sequence so that they can work it, it faster. And as far as I am aware, of, there isn't any uh, optimization for the telecom yet. They are working on that, but I'm not sure when the tech code optimization will be released. Um, if you are interested in uh, participation in a discussion, you can uh, unmute your mic and discuss with us. Uh, you don't have to always talk um, or chat. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. You see that comment? Yep. Okay. Okay. So I think I will continue to the next session. So after the whole long uh, presentation, I think that uh, we must take some takeaway here so that we can continue to the next one. So the first one is that. Ruby VM executes the instruction by instruction, not line by line. And each line may consist of one or more than one instructions. And con con control frame are persisted during the program execution. What does this mean? It means that if your program stops at a particular instruction, you can actually go up and down to explore what is the current stock story, how your program lists the current situation, and because each control frame is attached to a context, you can explore everything in that context. For example, you can look at the uh, current variables of the various contexts, or you can um, get the argument of the current frame. So this is really strong tool for you to work on the pure later. So after that, this is the, let's get into the main question of today. How do Ruby debuggers work? How does it work? Actually, because Ruby VM execute your code instruction by instruction, it's it actually really hard for debuggers to execute your code or to know when to stop. Because usually when you touch a debugger, it usually stops at a by a slide and it, it stops at some events at the exception raising or stop after before a method is written. Therefore, there must be some way for the workers to do so. And it actually it is supported by Ruby. So Ruby is very generous and is really friendly to developer. It provides hooks in some into the VM called the trace API. 
So the first one means like before any instruction is executed, it checks the flux, and if the flux um, match that uh, what the Ruby debuggers on the register, it will stop and it will call the block with the register. So if instruction is mapped with some flux, and it is on red, and we mentioned that it is the trace event. So if you go back into the uh, code again, you can see that on the right it is some big. There are some big errors, and they are on the trace board event. Yeah, and Ruby support a lot of event type. The most common one is the live event, which is uh, li. It means that Ruby debugger and or Ruby VM will stop before a live start. And there are some other events, such as the call event, the return event. So to use the trace mode, you can look at the support event. So you actually just need to call one method, press one dot trace and which type of event you are interested in. And after that, you can see that you can access to the path, the line number, the save, the binding, and even can uh, evaluate some support in the context of the frame. It is really useful. So, in theory, on the Ruby debuggers, you this feature to eliminate this support. So, how does it work? So, on Ruby debuggers have their own records and control flow management. And when they stop at any uh, point, and they will restore the trace point with Ruby. And then when the trace point stops, they will start a, a REPL section to be saved a user input and they will filter the control flow from that. It is uh, their control flow. They will control the current program to the next line and I'll continue or just step into the deeper execution. And then if it is not a control flow command, they will execute the support as the Ruby support in that case. That's it. It's really, really simple mechanism. But in theory, it is a theory. So let's go into the detail. So how you can build your own debugger. Oh, oops, some type of your own debugger, not your down debugger, sorry. <laughs> so it is a really simple debugger I built for today presentation. Right now, you can see that I created a class called Ruby Twister debugger, and it has only one class method called start. And in this method, it will register a new response and we care about the new live event only. Therefore, we just register the trace point the live event. And this, the, in, and this method, it will bring and try to get on the user input with the uh, guest method, and then we will uh, match the user input with some our control flow, which is next or continue. So if the if it is the next one, is just wrap the current uh, IEPL session, and it will let the program continue. Or if the continue program, it will disable all the straight ones so that the program can continue again. So it is really simple and straightforward. You can see that it actually works. And after you put it into your program, just by this method, Ruby Twister Deploy Doc Start. Yeah, that's it. It's really simple. And when you execute the support again, you will see something like this. Yep. You can execute and you can get the value of A, B, and can you can you next to stop at the next line. However, it it is a little bit too hard to use or even useless in your use case. So I will add a little bit more thing into this debugger. And before debugger do anything, it will the print print the current line on the on the surrounding glass of code into the screen so that you can have an indicator of uh, where is the current line from. And then it should bring the current in location information like the class, the method, the bus on the line number. And finally, it will read the support and try to bring the support line by line. And uh, it has an indicator to show whether it is the current support or not. So let's run, let's run this uh, program again. Yep. Right now it looks uh, more beautiful and maybe it looks a little bit like a uh, Bible. 
or something. Yep. It's actually only about 20 lines of code, and you have a workable debugger. So because Ruby only provides you a lot of things, really, they're really generous so that you can build your debugger by yourself. However, building a debugger is not really easy because you have to care more because most of the debuggers will have something like the record management, advanced control flow, and advanced content capture so that you can make your variable uh, more efficient. And finally, only the debugger must be stable and reliable as well. Uh, sorry, I mean, they must be reliable and must be stable because your bugs are already really hard to find. And now if your debugger has a bug in them, it must kill you. So if you are really interested in building a debugger, you can look at the Ruby by built-in debugger, which is uh, after Ruby support, or you can reach the support of Ruby by bug, which is implemented by C. Yep, a little bit hard to read, but it still works. So right now we already have built a Ruby debugger, and we know that you already use the debugger a lot. However, it is really really painful to debug something. Why? I have used Ruby for about five years, but every time I touch the debugger, there's something really, really bug me. The first one is that debugger, your, your bug is really painful enough, and it's already hit up on your metal platform. However, your debuggers have you debug some code, but it's not very pleased to do so. First one, you have to remember a lot of you have to remember the current variables. You have to remember the current context of the current line of code because the UI are not very straightforward and it keeps like popping up a lot. And then you have to type a lot of things to control the current flow of the yoga time. Yeah, you have to type next, 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 enter, next, enter, continue, enter. Or even you have to try to push your variable out and then you forgot, totally forgot what you are at. And if you have to type some command to get the current line again, also the, the related information you need. So that is the real destruction. And sometimes because the worker doesn't care whether it's in your shell or whether it's in your application, it will continue jumping randomly if you cannot control it. And sometimes, actually not sometimes, very often I jump into a definition of the method into the REST framework. I'm not in, interested in that method. So I have to zoom out. But when zoom out, it goes everywhere. So it will be hard, really hard to control. And finally, I'm not a very, um, I'm not a man with, with a very good memory. So I depend a lot on the visualize myself. And I will need everything to show up on the screen so that I can look at it and I can understand what is going on. So that's why I'm looking for a good debugger. I said over and over again, but it's really hard to find. Who we might have been scored by some better experience, but it is in the editing only, in the debugging information. There's a really, really far gap between the who we might be scored to the experience debugging user terminal. Because it's just like, there's a mesh, or it doesn't have enough functionality, although it has nice UI. So that's why I decided to build my own debugger to solve this issue. So I would like to introduce Ruby a gem called Ruby Jam. So this gem, this gem is a debugger. I mean to provide better experience while you debug Ruby. And it provides the on the visual interface to show all the information you need on the screen with a first line and on the v, on the information which is really relevant, really smart and formatic in a really rubber way, so that you will be can focus your mental effort and just um, everything on the box you are finding, not to navigate or not to remember anything else. So after all, you can focus more on your debug tool. So how does it work? It is really easy to use. It's the same way when you use my book. When you put the Ruby jar, uh, require Ruby jar gem here, and you put a um, single method called Ruby jar here, and just run the support, it will become something like this. Yeah, it visualizes everything you need on the screen. The support, the box stripe, the current press, or the current variables. 
you don't need to type anything. So you, you are at the first line, can know what is the value of A, what is the value of D or N. And then you can just go up, go down to explore all the variables in the structure. And then you can just like step out of any uh, function you are not interested in anymore. In the future, oh no, not right now, it's about other things such as the um, key value. It means that you don't need to tick, uh, you, talk, you type anything and press and start again. It's about to go by key binding and other customization so that you can enable or you can disable any screen on the screen or you can add something which is not common. For example, I can put and I can show up the Yacht instruction into my debugging screen because I care about that, but not everyone. So it is really customizable for your workflow. And in the future, it can do a lot of things like this, jumping into and filter the uh, stack trace so that you can um, filter out everything you don't need or you can watch a variable that exception it will handle mouse and scrolling or you can have a tool to inspect the variables better so it in the future but right now it's just in the fun far um, uh, site but I will implement that really soon so get started how to get started just install the Ruby Zemjas and you can read the document at rubyjars.org or visit my github so it's really straightforward and before ending this talk i will try to summarize everything you need to remember after this talk so the first one is that ruby process your code into a pipeline the first one is tokenization second one is passed into the instruction tree and the next one is to combine to the instruction and feed instructions to ruby vm and then your ruby vm your will execute your code instruction by instruction and push for the control frame on the time and manipulate the variable environment stack. And then Ruby VM provide a hook system called stress one. So that on the device implement is magic by the straighter. And finally, finally, Ruby Zar looks really good, so let's download that. So uh, I think that's it for today's talk. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Yeah. Um, for your very much passionate contribution. Um, so right now, the next step of our uh, Ruby Tuesday is that we are going to have a small Ruby quiz. Um, it would be organized via Kahoot. Okay. And do you have your phone here? Let's just take out your phone. Okay. I will take out my phone and let's try to do the quiz. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you pass the Google link again in the uh, chat session? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So give me one second. Should be fine. Oh, okay. actually, I will leave this session for you. So <laughs> sure, absolutely. All right. So you would need to go to kahoot.it and enter the game pin. All right, and then you would need, you would see your nickname on the screen. Yeah. All right, and we are waiting for, I don't want to show. Well, um, I would like to introduce you all to Han Wing, uh, who is a part of our Ruby team. He would be helping me to explain some of the technical details of the questions. Come here. Is everybody okay? Are we waiting for another one minute?
right, one more minute. All right, the pink code for the game here. All right, thank you, Olivier. Um, you need to see the screen that I'm presenting um, so that you will see the questions. All right, let's start. Uh, yeah. So this is the answer for the question. Are you ready for the next? Happy leader. All right, is everybody good? Nobody answer correctly for this one. Uh, if you have any questions or need explanation on any of the questions, uh, please unmute and let us know. Okay, ready for the next one? coming oh. 
All right, is everybody good to go with this one? Okay, one last question. So 
stay focused, everyone. Let's see who are our winners. Oh, from Brass and A. Jump. All right, congrats. Can you please let us know who you are? <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for participating in the small quiz that we have. Hopefully it has been interesting for you. Um, right now, we would be welcoming our second speaker for today. Um, but first, let's take a two minutes break so that we can reset the presentation and also to be equipping with uh, the presentation for our second speaker. So stay tuned and we'll come back in two in two minutes. All right, sorry, uh, one more minute and we'll be right back. So first, uh, please welcome Bay, uh, who is our second speaker from Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Um, OK. Um, just checking if you guys uh, can see my screen. Not really sure why my slide is automatically moving. Is there anyone taking control? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me check again.
I'm back guys. So sorry again, there was a little hic hiccup from my side. Um, so again, hi everyone. So um, thank you Ruby Saigon community for having me today. Uh, and I would like to say hello to everyone joining online. Um, let me introduce a little bit about myself first. So my name is Vi. Uh, I'm coming from Microsoft Vietnam working as uh, partner technology strategies taking care of the local partner uh, community ecosystem. So, um, you know what, when I was invited to this Ruby Tuesday event, I was a little bit worried because maybe, maybe I am the only one here who knows very little about the Ruby language. I was a developer writing code in C Sharp, in JavaScript, in TypeScript, and I'm still doing that. But Ruby is something that is very, very new for me. So I heard about the language. I heard about Ruby on Rails. That's it. So I questioned myself, what should I be sharing with you guys? Am I coming here on behalf of Microsoft to sell Microsoft Azure or some sort of solutions from our company? Then I decided to come up with today's topic, part like your Ruby workload with Azure DevOps. Because I think DevOps is a repeatable topic, is a repeatable practice. No matter what language or what framework you're using, no matter you are a developer, a team lead, or a delivery manager, I believe that it would be very useful in your planning activities and in your daily execution activities. So, um, okay. So let me move on to the next slide. So here is my agenda for today. Actually, I was notified that I have like 30 minutes to present. So the first five minutes is about the death of culture. Um, this, the next 10 minutes, I will talk about Azure DevOps, and for the last 10 minutes, I will have a very simple demo, a very simple showcase for you guys, and then we can have a Q&A session. So in this presentation, you know, I'm not going to walk you through what is DevOps, what is CI, what is CD, what is continuous integration, what is continuous deployment. That would be another longer presentation. The message that I want to deliver today is that, um, you know, many times, many, many times when we're caught in a project, there are a lot of conflicting priorities. As you can see in this slide, innovation versus reliability. So your project manager wants to speed up. They ask you to deliver faster. And at the same time, your customer wants reliability. They want a product that satisfies their business requirement. Um, at the same time, that product also needs to be able to scale to support the increasing number of customers. At the same time, that product also needs to be user friendly. At the same time, that product also needs to be flexible enough to cater for business change and to be able to run back in case of disasters. So there are a lot of priorities, but from my experience as a developer, there is one big 
road blocker that this situation introduces. So that one is the time needed for a change to happen. So when there is a requirement change, most of the time we are in you know, a reactive position, we are in a passive position. We only be able to deal with to deal with the change case by case instead of having a proactive action plan. So I I am a developer at heart, at heart as I share with you. So I experience this, these things every day. So we heard about DevOps, but what do we know about it? So let's look at the text on the screen. DevOps is the union of people, process, and product in order to enable the continuous uh, delivery of the value to our end customers. So I know more or less most of you should already have a CI CD pipeline in your project set up in place. Maybe it is 100% continuous. Maybe you have to do manual stuff here and there. But the message here I want to emphasize is that do not think that this is just a technical console. It's a culture. Do not think that only engineers or delivery managers should care about it. You have to like take one step back and think about DevOps as a combination of your team, the Scrum process, and the product you're working on. And we cannot lack any one of the three. So here is a summary slide for a research. There are a lot of numbers and fancy illustrations. However, the message is very simple. If you apply the right practice into the delivery pipeline, you will be able to deliver much faster and the, manage, the management and the customer will be a lot happier. So we can look at the circle on the right and we can see that continuous delivery is actually a cycle. So first, we plan the delivery. We use agile methodology like Scrum to run the planning we organize a Scrum team with a product owner, developers, and testers. We plan for a sprint of two weeks, et cetera, et cetera. Se oh, sorry. Second, we build, we develop, and we test. We write code in Ruby. We continuously integrate our new code into the test environments. We do the automation testing continuously. But we release, we deploy the product to production let's say onto Azure as a platform. Finally, we track and we monitor the performance of the application in production. So that's like an, a repeating cycle, an endless cycle. And that's what DevOps is about. When we talk about DevOps, we think about CICD. Actually, as I said, it's the collaboration between you know, the people, the process, the product, from the moment we plan for a product to the moment we operate the product in production. Anytime we think about the ability to continuously to deliver value to our customer, we are actually talking about the depth of culture. So what I have been talking to now is very abstract. I think let's jump into a product in order to see what we can do in practice. So I'm not wasting your time anymore. Maybe you heard about Azure DevOps. Maybe you're using it in your project. Maybe you're totally a newbie. But I just want to say that this is a very powerful platform that enables you to achieve on the stuff within one interface from Scrum project management, Git repository, CI, CD pipeline, test automation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this slide. So, so um, last year, maybe you heard about one of the most famous acquisitions from Microsoft GitHub. And somebody is worrying about this because they do not trust a community product into the hand of Microsoft, right? <laughs> so the good news I can tell you is that GitHub and Azure DevOps are now under the same leadership team in Microsoft. So they are not really competing products, but GitHub is more for the community, for the startup community, whereas Azure DevOps is more for companies or enterprise customers. So they are not really competing. So they are growing in the same ecosystem. Uh, talking about DevOps, so let me walk you through five major products under its um, umbrella. We have Azure Board, 
for agile product management. We have Azure pipeline for creating CI CD pipeline to build, test, and deploy your code. We have Azure repository. We have GitHub repository to manage your source code. We have Azure test plan for test automation. We have Azure artifact for package management. So let's go very quickly about each of the product, and then we will jump into the demo. So I think the demo is a lot more exciting because um, we can see everything in practice. So first I will be talking about Azure Board. So this is where you manage your Agile project. For me, it's somewhere between Jello and Jira. I believe as a developer, you are very familiar with Jello or Jira, right? So Jello is very simple and we're just like moving working items between the columns while Jira is a little bit more complicated and is designed for many purposes, not just for software product development. Azure Board, our product is somehow something in between. Simple enough, but also has enough functionalities for you to manage a Scrum uh, development project. You can create epic user story, you can use Scrum boards, planning tools to organize sprints, stand up planning meetings. You can drag your work with uh, backlog, dashboard, custom reporting. You can use your code to link to the working item. You can link your code to the working item. And you can also gain insights into the status of your project. Um, and yeah, that's a very powerful analytics and that's port that we are incorporated into the product. Um, the second one I think will be more interesting for developers and you know, um, DevOps engineers is the Azure pipeline. Is where you can, this is where you can create CI CD pipeline and configure for delivery process. Um, I think the best thing about it is it works with any language, any platform, and any cloud. So you can get your code from GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. You can build, you can test, you can deploy using Node.js, Ruby on Rails, Python, Java, whatever. You can run parallel operation system like Linux or Windows. You can deploy to Azure, or AWS, or Google Cloud Platform, or even on-premise data center. And I think the best thing about it is the first 1,800 minutes is free. And I think it's enough for every project that we're running, you know, in Azure environment. Uh, Azure repository, just think of it, you know, as an, an alternative for GitHub. So you can use GitHub, you can use Azure repo. The best thing is that it gives you unlimited private Git repository hosting, even if you are in the free flag. Uh, Azure. Azure test plan for test automation, Azure artifact for um, you know package management like Maven, NPM, or NuGet, or whatever kind of package management you want to in incorporate into the CI/CD pipeline. So I just go very very quick about the product, and I think this is not a marketing event, so I'm not going to talk any more about the product. Uh, what I will do what I will do is to share with you a case study. What I instruct a, like a customer to, you know, how to use it, utilize our, how to develop the depth of culture in their company and how to use it like the right tool in order to, you know, speed up their delivery process. So as you can see, we talk about Azure DevOps and all the products under it. Um, the most important thing now is how we can incorporate everything into like a pipeline. So maybe here you, we have Azure Board. You can think of it. Uh, you can think about Jira or Jello. Now we have Azure Board. We have you, the engineer team, the developer, the tester, the BA. We have uh, Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. Um, you know, the IDE for writing code. We have Azure repository. Uh, the alternative can be GitLab, Bitbucket, or even GitHub. 
we have Azure Test Plan and Azure Pipeline. So you can think of Circle CI or Java CI or even the traditional Jenkins, et cetera. And then we have the Azure environment. So that's the Microsoft Cloud, but it can be other alternatives like uh, Google Cloud Platform or AWS, right? So, sorry. So, um, now we can have everything in one single tool. So, um, starting from planning, uh, ending at production, monitoring, and governance, right? Starting from planning, ending at production, everything must be under control and everything should be set up into a pipeline to ensure end-to-end -end delivery. Let me give you a very, very specific example. We can look at uh, this diagram, this architecture. So let's say I have a Ruby on Rails application posted in a Git repository here, right? Uh, in the Git repository, I have two major branches, develop and master. When a developer writes new code, they will continuously merge into the develop branch, right? When the code is ready for going to production, we will create a pull request and merge the develop branch into the master branch. So this is the normal process in your team, right? So let's look at the environment, the second column. We have two environment here, development environment and production environment. Um, I use Azure App Service for hosting the app. So in case you're not familiar with Azure or what service is under it, just think of it as a mini server where you can package your Ruby on Rails application into a zip file and drop it there. And that's a fully managed, uh, like, platform as a service, which means we already have the tools that you need to have insights into the traffic and the performance of your app. So this is for the environment. Um, as you can see for production environment here, I have two slots. They are identical. One I call review and the other I call production. The idea here, the, the idea here is that Every time we decide to go to production, we bring the code from the master branch right here to the preview slot. First, if everything is okay, we can swap it with the current production by swapping virtual IB, right? So the preview becomes production and production becomes preview. And this is something that I think it's a very good practice. It's called blue, uh, blue green deployment. So if we're doing this way, we can have like three benefits. We can have, you know, the opportunity to do a final test on the preview before going live, right? And the second, the most important benefit is that the production is always up. There is no downtime experienced by the end user. And lastly, if there is something wrong, we can quickly run back to the previous version, right? So this is a very simple example that I think any software development team can follow and can develop a similar strategy for your delivery pipeline. Um, now, I, I think let's see the real thing in practice. I will share my, my browser. So my presentation ends here. Uh, let me share my browser uh, on how I do this thing in practice, right? Let me try to share the browser again, a window, uh, Chrome. Okay, so as you can see here, this is the user interface for Azure DevOps. So I have one project. It's like a project in Jira or a project in Jello. So if I go into the project, um, there are actually five products under it. As I said, as I mentioned before, the first one is the Azure board. So you can think of it as a Kanban board or 
you know, you know, a scrum board. You know, you can create user story. You can move status around. You can assign to the right people in your team. You can lock the box. You can, you know, lock any issues that happen in your day-to-day -day activities, right? The second is Azure repository. This is where I host and manage the source code. So let's say I have a very simple uh, Azure, uh, Ruby on Rails application source code here. Um, so it's very simple. I just copy the template from the internet. And what it does is to, you know, I'll put on the screen some text, some fancy text like this. So this is my first Ruby on Rails uh, application. I try to learn a little bit about the syntax. I try to learn a little bit about how to deploy the application into the live environment, and this is the result. So maybe today you have one one more newbie Ruby on Ruby developer, <laughs> I guess. So um, this is the, the repository. Um, Okay, so this is the pipeline, CI/CD pipeline. You can actually uh, build a continuous integration pipeline here, and everything is, I think, is very simple for you guys, because um, you know everything is under a user interface, and you can actually drag and drop and use you know widgets in order to come up with you know a continuous integration pipe. Let's say, for example, what I did here is I tried to get the source code from the Git repository. I archive the files into a zip file, and then I drop, I publish the artifact into Azure Artifact. So this is somewhere that I store the deployment package, right? Now, let's look at the release pipeline, the continuous delivery pipeline. So as you can see here, when there is, let's say, when there is a developer commit the code, uh, push the code to uh, the Git repository, the continuous integration pipeline will integrate that new code into a package, right? And it will drop that package here. So this is where the continuous delivery pipeline start. So as I said before, we have two branches develop range and production and master range. And correct, um, in correspondence, we have two environment, develop environment and production environment. So let's check uh, the configuration that I have here. So what I have here, the consider configuration here is that is saying that if the build is from the develop range, then let's build the develop environment, right? Let's check um, the configuration in the second branch. So it is saying that if the view is on the master branch right here, let's do the production release, right? So very simple. Um, let's dive into one uh, you know, task here. For example, for deploying into develop environment, what I do, what I do is that I drop the package into the right deployment slot in Azure. So you can do the same thing with Google Cloud. You can do the same thing with uh, AWS, and even you can do the same thing with, uh, you know, your on-premise data center. And we have uh, built-in template for that. And even if there is no template, you can even write YAML code in order to, you know, write the pipeline. So let's go back here. Um, let's check again a history of the deployment that I have here. So let's go from uh, the bottom to the top. So let's say for release three, I have my code integrated into the develop range. So let's say some developer writes some code and then they merge their feature into the develop range. Because of the rule that I said earlier, so only the develop environment 
is built, right? Then if I merge the developed branch into the master branch, right? Because of the rule that I said earlier, like remember the two branches, right? So this time the production environment is being built. And as we said, for production, we have preview and production. So what we're doing here is that we drop, we, we build the preview environment first, and then we are doing one manual step, one uh, approval step. Like you can add your customer email, you can add your delivery manager emails into you know, the pre redeployment conditions. So when he sees that uh, the preview environment is ready, he can go here, he receives the email, he can go here to test the preview environment first. And if everything is okay, he click approve, and then a production swap takes place, right? And then you can have everything in production. And let me show you here. So this is what I have in the production environment. So this is update second, sorry. Let me show you what I have here in the preview environment. So this is update one and in the development environment. So in the develop range, we have the latest code, right? In the production range, we have the most reliable, the most sustainable code, right? So for example, if um, you know we are working in a scrum sprint, we are at the end of the second week, so we need to do a, de a production deployment. So what we're doing is that we try to merge the code from the develop range into the master branch. We are doing that by create a pull request, right? So let me try to create a pull request. So if we are in a team, we can ask our team members to review our code here. We can assign people to review our code. We can assign reviewers to review our code. We can tax uh, our code. We can also, um, you know, link what we're doing with a specific work item, with a user story, with a task, with a bug, anything. And then if the reviewer approves the deployment, like your team lead approves the deployment and complete the merge. So what we're seeing here is that a continuous integration takes place. So as you can see here, a build is being triggered and we may need uh, to wait for like a couple of minutes like three or five minutes in order for the build to complete actually it's already complete so let's check the release pipeline so as you can see here because the new code is in the master branch so develop it is saying not deployed but for the previous log it's saying in, prog in progress Right. So let's wait for uh, the deployment to complete and then we get back. So in the meantime, I would like to share the slide again. Um, let me share my screen again so you don't, do not have to wait for the deployment. One second. A window, another slide. Okay. So. Let me share the screen again. So um, just 
one second for marketing. So in Vietnam, we have a developer community for you know Microsoft Azure and Cloud. So it's not just about uh, Microsoft product, but it's a very centric uh, developers community. So if you're interested, you can join our communities from here, and uh, we will have very strong and close engagement with you know every member in the community. And uh, the second, the second one is that uh, if you are interested in my slide, you can actually download the slide using this link, and I have a more detailed slide in this link, so you can discover the Azure DevOps culture, the Azure DevOps product, and what are the best practices that we have set up in place. So if you're interested, you can go to this link and download my slide. Okay, so, so that's it. So let's get back to my browser to see what is the progress of the deployment. Start sharing. Using a window, uh, Ruby DevOps. Okay. So as you can see here, the preview environment is now ready. So let's check it in the lot. So as you remember, so the word latest is coming from the development branch, right? We merge in, in into the master branch and the CD pipeline triggers and now the code is now in the preview environment here. So as a team lead, as a delivery manager, I can come to this link to do a final test on the deployment. And then if everything is okay, so actually there is an email sending to my mailbox. If everything is okay, I can go here to approve the swap. So what we have here is that, okay, we can approve the swap and then we wait for a couple of seconds. And let's check the production again, it is still, it still has the old code, but just in a, a second, I will try to refresh this again. So in the meantime, if you have anything, any question or any concerns, you can unmute yourself and ask me, or you can type your question in the chat box. I would be really happy to you know, receive your feedback and to answer your question. It's not happening. It's still connecting. You know what? Because I'm on, I'm running on the free plan, the free plan. So um, sometimes there is hiccup here and there, but I guarantee you. Uh, we have like 1,800 free build minutes. So this is, um, you know, almost ready for any, you know, Scrum project or Agile project. So do not think of me as someone who is coming here to sell Microsoft product. Actually, I'm trying to introduce you with, you know, something that you can immediately apply into your, you know, daily working process. Um, maybe in the meantime, we can um, discover other, you know, product under Azure DevOps, including Azure Dev Plan test plan. So this is where you can develop and you know run your automation testing, Azure Artifact. This is where you can you know create you know, package management, you know, uh, a system for package management. Let's get back to the pipeline. The swap is actually taking place. And as you can see here, the production now has the latest code. So this is the code that we see in the develop range like 10 minutes ago. But 
everything is automated and now we see the code in production. And if we check the previous lot again, it is actually swapped with the production. And let's say if there is anything wrong with the new production, with the new feature, with the new code, what we can do is that we can actually swap the preview and production again so that uh, we can somehow cover that error from the end customers, right? So um, this is the end of my presentation. So um, thank you everyone for listening. If you have any question, again, please unmute yourself or you know, type it in the chat box. Let me check the chat. So there is one question, Azure, do it, um, Gavin, do you have free coupon for Azure VPS? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, you might already know that uh, the per when you are a new customer, Azure has $200 of free credit, uh, you know, for to run your application, to run your workload in Azure. However, for Azure DevOps, it is free to start with. So everything is free. As I said, the first uh, 1,800 uh, minutes is free. And the first five users is free. So I think it, it's still very, very cheap, I guess, very affordable to be more exact. So if you are interested in Azure, you can actually go to the portal and sign up for a free account with, um, you know, $2,000 credit. Oh, thanks, Gavin. Uh, now, can you please also paste the link for the community, the mm -hmm. Microsoft community, as well as the PowerPoint slides sure, sure, sure. on the chat so that everyone can check out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me paste the link here. Um, where is it? Yeah. Actually, um, just one, I just want to share with you that I, I already come up with the next topic if I am ever to be invited to this event. So the next topic would be something, would be infrastructure as code. So we're not doing things manually again. We are uh, incorporate, we are adopting the Azure DevOps and we are trying to build infrastructure as code practice. And that would be a very interesting uh, practice, uh, interesting application into your day-to-day -day project, I guess. Yeah, and we would be absolutely happy to have you again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Well, always. Okay. All right. So thank you, um, Min and also Gavin, mm -hmm. for your participation and also your sharing. We absolutely really appreciate it. Yeah. And um, well, we always want to make the event better. So if you would like to organize with us to make the event better for everyone, please just uh, let us know. Or if you want to become our speaker, also mm -hmm. reach out. Yeah. Um, and hopefully COVID-19 would be over very soon so that we can organize so. a really uh, fun socializing at our venue, as you can see here. Yeah. Uh, we have space for everyone, so yeah. hopefully we can get to know a lot of people. I was so now. excited to see like everyone in like a, a room with full of people today. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I have to present online. Yeah. yeah. So we absolutely will invite you again for mm -hmm. that, so that uh, you know we can all socialize and get to know more people. Yeah, yeah I think a lot of people are also looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So thanks a lot, everyone, um, for your participation until now, and I hope that you will have a lovely evening. See you very soon. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.